Good morning. Welcome to the second hour today. We'll be continuing our study in the book of Matthew, beginning with chapter 8 and verse 23. But before we begin, let's pray. Open with prayer. We thank you for your word, Lord, and the opportunity we have to study together. We ask you to be with us and to direct us in our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The purpose of Matthew in chapters 8 and 9 is to offer the credentials of the Messiah. Uh, we know that the purpose of miracles is to authenticate the message of the speaker. And in chapters 8 and 9, Matthew is going to describe three types of miracles. Last week we looked at his miracles of healing, uh, verses 1 to 17, and we looked at his teaching on the cost of discipleship. And today we're going to be looking at uh, his miracles of power, uh, his authority over nature and storms, his authority over demons and the spirit world, and his authority to forgive sins. Then next week we'll look at the next set of miracles. Let's begin with verse 23 through 25. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And he came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. It's kind of difficult to know how much Matthew may have intended to convey with this comment that disciples followed Jesus into the boat. Perhaps he meant that it, was, it symbolizes the uh, disciples' proper response to Jesus in view of the, the verses we just went through, uh, where he's, the cost of discipleship that we went over last week. On the occasion that Matthew described, the waves were so high that they kept spilling over into the boat. Evidently, Jesus was asleep. He was resting. He could rest and sleep in the storm because he knew that the time for his death had not yet arrived. Therefore, he was safe from the storm. So he could lay in the area of the boat where disciples had given him some privacy and he could fall asleep. He was safe. Well, the disciples realized then their inability to cope with the situation they found themselves in. They called on Jesus to, to help, to save them. Uh, they obviously thought that he could do something to help. They were following him. He was in charge of the group. However, their fear reveals that they didn't really appreciate who he was. So let's see how Jesus responded to them in 26 and 27. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? You men of little faith. Jesus did not rebuke his disciples for disturbing him, but for uh, failing to trust him, as they should have. He said they had little faith. The word was only used in the Synoptic Gospels and only to address his disciples. Wherever Matthew used this word in his gospel, it always uh, reflects basically a failure to see the whole picture, a failure to take in God's perspective. Faith in Messiah and fear basically are mutual, mutually exclusive. If you have fear, you don't have faith. Therefore, disciples should not have been afraid. Even though disciples believed Jesus could help them, they failed to take into consideration of three things. Jesus has a purpose here on earth. He was the Messiah. The Messiah was here for a purpose. How could the divine Messiah, whom God had sent, die in a storm before he finished his job? That was impossible. Another thing they didn't consider was that Jesus called them to be his disciples. And they would, have, they would have purpose at this point in time that they wouldn't be able to fulfill. 
if they were to die in a storm. Their work was not done. Jesus called them and promised to make them fishers of men, and this had not been accomplished yet. Jesus called them to be his disciples so that uh, they could be sent out to proclaim the gospel. He was teaching them, but had not finished teaching them. He had not sent them out yet, so how could they die and devote along with Jesus? If we remember back in uh, Old, Testament, Old Testament teachings, and uh, we go through the Psalms and <clears throat> some of the things that, at the time of David, we see that David always knew that God wasn't finished with him yet. And, and he could stand on that and know that his enemies would be defeated. They could not be able to defeat him. He knew that because God called him, God made promises to him, and he had not seen the result of those promises. And he could stand on the purpose that God had called him for and, uh, and, and know that he was safe. Now, he would feel fear in his psalms, but he always would come right back after that and be trusting God. We look at Abraham on the other hand. He had these promises from God. And uh, uh, even just the one, that he, that he and Sarah will bear a child. Well, if that hadn't been done yet, then he and Sarah were safe from dying. But yet when it goes into Egypt and it goes into a couple of other places, he says, hey, you're so pretty. Pharaoh down there, he's going to want to kill me and marry you. Well, he should have known better. Because they hadn't had a kid yet, the Pharaoh was not going to kill him. God was going to protect both of them until he carried out his purpose in their life. Um, so Abraham responded differently than David did. And Jesus responded in the storm like David does. His disciples responded kind of like Abraham did. Um, but basically, they did not consider who Jesus is as a Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And we see this in their response in verse 27. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? The reader of Matthew's gospel, you know, they, they would know better. We're talking about the Jews that Matthew wrote the gospel to. They would know better than the disciples did. Jesus is the virgin-born Messiah. God with us, come to provide salvation and to set up his kingdom. If they had considered that Jesus is the Messiah and had the nature of God, then how could they forget uh, what was presented in uh, Psalm 89, verse 8, where it says, O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea, and when its waves rise, you still them. And we have the same problem. Um, they should have considered who Jesus was by now, but like us, being mere men, we also have this terrible storm that comes into our lives sometimes. We often forget who Jesus is. When we cry out for help, do we cry out in fear, or do we cry out in faith? Even today, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, we have bouts of being people with little faith. But we should not use this as an excuse. I mean, this is normal Christian life. You know? <laughs> uh, but when this happens, Jesus does not abandon us, but stands ever ready with his saving power to sustain us. It's much easier for us to have great faith when, as mentioned in verses uh, 18 to 22, we're following him and giving priority to him over material things and family and friends. We must always, he must always be first in our lives. When we forget this and we put ourselves, things, or others first, then we become people of little faith. Let's look at the next miracle. Begin Reading in verse 28, Jesus also has authority over the spirit world and especially demonic power. <clears throat> when he had come to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him. 
as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Gadara was the regional capital of the Decapolis area that lay southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Its population was strongly Gentile. This may account for the presence of many swine in verse 30. The Gadara region stretched west to the Sea of Galilee, and this was the country of the Gadarenes. Mark and Luke mentioned only one man, but Matthew said there were two. Mark and Luke evidently mentioned the more prominent one. Perhaps Matthew mentioned both of them because the testimony of two witnesses. Remember, his audience is Jewish, strictly Jewish. Uh, the evidence of the testimony of two witnesses was valid in Jewish courts. The Jews believed that demonic spirits could and did take over the bodies and personalities of certain individuals. Matthew reflected this view in the spirit world. A literal reading of scripture leads to the same conclusion. Demons are fallen angels who are Satan's agents. These demoniacs live lives of terror among the tombs, always away from other people, in a place that rendered them basically ritually unclean in Judaism. Verse 29, and they cried out saying, what business do you have with us, with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance for them, and the de demons began to entreat him, saying, If you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. Well, the demoniacs hated and feared Jesus. They recognized him as the Messiah calling him by the messianic title, Son of God. The disciples in the boat did not recognize who he was, but these demoniacs recognized him right away. The, the demons, one thing we can learn about demons is they know who Jesus is. And uh, the person that they are speaking through, that they inhabit it, and they're speaking through, it'll appear that that person knows who Jesus is, but it's really those demons inside of them. But they asked two questions. Why are you here? And have you come to torment us before the time? Well, these questions go together as one question. The second question reveals also their knowledge that Jesus was going to judge them one day. And this was a messianic function. Evidently, Jesus will cast them into the lake of fire when he sends Satan there. These demons ask if he was planned to judge them or torment them right then and there. And Matthew tells us there was a herd of many pigs in a distant pasture. These pigs probably belong to Gentile pig farmers, and as in this area, there lives, there's a huge number of Gentiles. And Jesus did not answer their previous questions, but after looking around, the demons asked another question. If you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. So we know two things about the demons. They don't like to go homeless. And also exercised evil spirits sometimes express their rage with acts of violence and vengefulness. We see that and we're going to see that when we get to chapter 17. In verse 32, and he said to them, go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished into the waters. The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. So Jesus responded to this request by simply commanding them, Go! The swine, by stampeding into the waters, are now, that, that leaves the demons homeless. So why did they do this? Why, to the pigs? I believe the demons drove the pigs into the sea for vengeance and to make trouble for Jesus. We can see this by the response of the locals in the next couple of verses. Why did Jesus allow the demons to enter the swine and destroy the herd? 
and cause the owners considerable loss? That's a good question too. But it appears that the answer to this question is outside Matthew's field of interest here. These details do, however, clarify the reality of the exorcism and the destructive effect of the demons. The demons recognized who Jesus is. They knew of his great power as well as their final judgment and torment. But comparing that to, to that of the local gatherings, they asked him to leave. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They have just witnessed great power over the demonic world and that didn't mean a thing to them. All they saw was all the money that they lost and the loss of their pigs and the cost of replacing them. They begged them to leave the region. And as Messiah, Jesus is the judge of the spirit world as well as humankind, the supernatural world as well as the natural world. He has all the power over demons as well as all power over nature. So let's look at his third miracle of power, the power and authority to forgive sin. Chapter 9, verse 1. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. <clears throat> In verse 1, Jesus gave the Gadarenes what they wanted. He would leave them. He doesn't force his blessing upon those that don't want it. Matthew uses this verse as a good transition verse to set the stage for what follows, the next miracle that takes place in Capernaum, his home base. In verse 2, important deals or details are mentioned uh, in Mark 2, uh, 1 to 12, and Luke 5, 17 to 26. And those details are not contained in Matthew. Uh, Mark tells us that he was carried by four men. And Luke relates the breaking of the roof to let him down to Jesus. Matthew only uses details he needs. Uh, to make his point to his Jewish audience. Matthew's gospel is well planned out. We need to always keep in mind that uh, Matthew had a purpose for his gospel. And as we go through it, we see how well he's planned it. He's, he's put these miracles not in the order of time, in chronological order. He's taken these and grouped them in three sets to make up three different points, to make several points, actually, but he, he does this for the purpose of reaching out to his Jewish uh, brethren uh, to convince them that Jesus is their Messiah. We see that Jesus saw the faith of the men who were carrying their paralytic friend as well as the faith of the paralytic himself. The evidence of their faith was that they brought him to Jesus for healing. However, Jesus spoke only to the paralytic. He says, take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. What Jesus said implied a close connection between this man's sin and his sickness. And he implied that sin was the worst of the two. We need to get that taken care of first. It actually caused the other. He dealt with the sin problem first, for it was the most important. And forgiveness of sins is basic to healing. Some of the teachers of the law, the scribes, who were standing by, took offense at what Jesus said. He was claiming to forgive sins, but only God can forgive sins, since God is the one that people sin against. They called Jesus' words blasphemy, and this is the first instance of this charge in Matthew, but it will become a prominent theme. In this case, blasphemy means to say or do anything that insults the honor of God by claiming that he can do what only God can do, thus assuming the place of God. By saying this, Jesus was affirming that he was God. In verse 4, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? 
but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Well, by asking the question, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Jesus is letting them know that he knows what they're thinking. Because only God can search and know the heart of man. This is further proof that he's God and has the authority to forgive sins. He continues with this question. Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? Well, it's quite easy to just say your sins are forgiven because there's no visible evidence to prove that that, that, that was wrong, you know, whether it's right or wrong. Um, since only God has the authority to forgive sins, only God can say this without blaspheming God. No prophet of the Old Testament has ever claimed to forgive sins. On the other hand, Old Testament prophets have healed in the past by the power of God. It's much harder to say get up and walk to a paralytic because a paralyzed man would have to actually get up and walk, which everyone there knew this person and it was impossible for this man to do. Uh, I think ahead of time and uh, to actually look at a dead body and say, rise up and <laughs> walk him, which Jesus is gonna rise and raise a couple of people from the dead. That's, that takes, you know, that's harder to do than just say your sins are forgiven. In verse 9, but, you, but that you may know, that you may have full proof on this point, that you may see that I have power to forgive sin, I will perform an act which all must perceive and admit to require the power of God. And since it takes the power of God to heal the paralytic, then if Jesus was a blasphemer, he wouldn't be empowered with God's power. So since he had the power to heal, then his previous statement, your sins are forgiven, that had to be by the power of God too. You can't have a person that's not walking in the power of God in one, one instant and in, in continuation of that same instant. Now he is walking in the power of God. You gotta, you know, these things just don't happen. So he had the authority and the power to do both things or no authority of power at all. So he turned to paralytic and says, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. So let's see if Jesus is who he claims to be. Verse 7, and he got up and went home. Ah, he must be who he says he is. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Well, first we see the, the response of the paralytic to Jesus. He got up and went home. He was completely healed, proving that Jesus had the power and authority of God to heal. This in turn proved that he had the power and authority of God to forgive sins. Remember also that this man's sins were the cause of his paralysis. Then we receive the response of the crowds. They were awestruck. The fear of the Lord is proof that what they saw in the great miracle, nothing but the power of God is the awesome display of authority over sin and disease. And that just autumn. They also glorified God. They began to praise and worship God. Why? Because God had given such authority to men. The authority mentioned here is the authority to forgive sins. I mean, they had seen people healed before. Prophets have healed people, Moses. I mean, it's been part of their history. But never before has a man, uh, in their idea, in their, what they're seeing from their point of view, a mere man forgiving sins with, with the authority of God. Um, this is an interesting statement made by Matthew. The word men is plural here. Some commentators say that the crowd saw Jesus as a mere man and that they saw his power as a gift to mere men. Others say men is a plural of category. Uh, seeing God's gift uh, given to Jesus as a Messiah and that the Messiah, the one man Messiah, 
is a gift to all men. Well, as the crowd saw it, it's probably that they did not see Jesus as the Messiah, but as just a prophet or, or just you know, a regular man that God was using. Therefore, um, they see God giving authority to mere men to forgive sins. And one individual member of the human family, they saw the power actually displayed and regarded it as a new gift of God to humanity for which they gave God praise and they worshiped him. And the reason why I say that is because we know through the rest of the gospel that these, this crowd, these crowds of people, they did not accept Jesus as a Messiah on the spot and all get saved. Um, they did not all become his disciples. The readers of Matthew's gospel, however, after Jesus has you know, been resurrected and ascended to heaven, uh, and the gospel is written, the Jewish readers, they'll perceive uh, that this was the promised king to come to rule on the earth because that's Matthew's intent. He's proven that Jesus, he is trying to prove that Jesus is their king, their Messiah. And they will know by reading Matthew's account that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But that first set of those crowds that were there that was, before, that was before Jesus right, you know, rose from the dead, and 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 uh, we just see further witness that not the crowds just weren't saved. Yes, I have a, a, a New American Standard Bible, and the cross reference it says that, that when they were filled with awe, it it translated it feared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why. That's why I mentioned fear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They're they're feel, fear. They are feared with the fear of God. Um, okay. Yeah. But a side note here also in the church age, which was not unknown and under not understood at this time, in Matthew, uh, men do do have the authority to share Christ, and actually promise that if a person believes in Jesus Christ, his sins are forgiven. So in a sense, it's not that we have the authority to, pers to personally forgive men in, in the place of God, but we know that uh, when someone is saved, their sins are forgiven. So when we're witnessing to people, we can actually promise them, hey, you know, you need your sins forgiven? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. And your sins, if you're saved, your sins are forgiven. So today, we as mere men uh, we, we have the authority to make that promise. Uh, and we have the responsibility to teach others that their sins can be forgiven and then how to receive that forgiveness. Stanley Toussaint tells us this, and I'm going to quote from him to wrap up uh, things here. These three miracles give us a wonderful foreview and glimpse into the conditions of the kingdom. Thus, the king displays his power to bring these promised blessings to Israel. The stilling of the storm indicates the ability of Christ to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah. And then there's a list of those references here. And also Zechariah and Ezekiel. And then such kingdom passage as Zechariah 3, 1, 2, several in Daniel, these are exemplified in Christ casting out the demons. This miracle indicates he is capable of destroying Satan. And that Jesus is able to forgive sins and so bring about the conditions described in Isaiah is well proven by the incident of the healing of the paralytic. So that's the way uh, Stanley Toussaint sums up these three, this set of miracles here. And by this group of miracles, Matthew shows the king's power and authority to bring the kingdom of Israel um, if they will just only respond, respond by repentance. Remember, his gospel is the kingdom is at hand. I'm the king. I'm ready to do this. But you need to repent and believe in me. Any questions or comments? Okay, let's pray. 
Thank you again for demonstrating to us in your word the love of the Messiah, the divine nature and authority of Christ, and his willingness and ability to take care of our needs. Jesus is the only one we can trust to lean on when, we, when things get going tough. And we thank you for Matthew, Lord, that you have uh, used his gospel as proof that Jesus is the Messiah to your very own people. And we know later on that in the book of Acts that uh, people did believe uh, by the thousands and the thousands, your people. And we just praise you, Lord, that, that uh, you used Matthew to do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you watching on YouTube, thank you again for being here. We appreciate your presence online. As we end our service here in song, please feel free to do the same if you so desire. There's a link below in the description to a hymn that you may participate in. And thanks again, and God bless.